This is the second lab for respiration. And here is a video to start us off. Notice the diaphragm moving up and down. And notice you don't see the lungs. So the lungs are so thin, just the squamous epithelial cells, that you know where they are, but you don't actually see them. Now the lungs are sitting on top of the diaphragm, and as you pull the diaphragm, that's what causes the lungs to inflate, because they're riding. They're, there's a kind of a fluid that makes the lungs stick to the diaphragm. And so as you're pulling the diaphragm down, you pull the lungs down and they fill up with air. And then when you release, you'll see the diaphragm go back up. This is, if you go and look down the trachea, this is what it looks like. All right, so here are our objectives, and you need to understand a spirometer. So a spirometer, there's, there's all kinds. We've got the really fancy kind that are all electronic, and then we have the old-fashioned kind where you pinch the person's nose shut and force them to breathe through a mouthpiece, and they're literally blowing uh, air up under a dome, and it causes the dome to rise and fall, and there's an ink pen attached to it. So those are some of the earlier spirometers that I used to use a long time ago with students. And nowadays, you can blow into a mouthpiece, and it's recorded on a computer, which is what we usually do when we meet face-to-face. But since we're uh, observing COVID and we're doing everything online, then you guys have a simulation that you're going to run. All right. So you, the object of the game is to get the air outside the body, inside, and get some of the carbon dioxide that you have generated in your body outside. You need to exhale. So inspiration is pulling in. An expiration is pushing the air out. But of course, expiration also means to die. So don't get that confused. Breathing out is not dying. So the next page, we're going to look at a graph. And if you can learn this graph, you've got this whole concept cold. You, you understand it perfectly. So it's a really neat graph, and I've been using it for years. I really like it. So in, when you're breathing in, obviously your thoracic cavity is increased. So you literally expand your thorax and part of your abdomen. So that's because the diaphragm is moving and the costal muscles are, you have external and internal ones, that are contracting and they open up the, the space so that the lungs expand. So that's a little bit confusing when your muscle contracts that the diaphragm would get bigger or the area under above the diaphragm would get bigger. But anyway, that's how it works. Now, you will reduce the pressure inside the thorax. So there is more pressure outside surrounding you, just in the ambient air around you, than there is inside of your thoracic cavity. So if, heaven forbid, something stabbed you in the lung, an ice pick, a, uh, your steering wheel of your car, if you're not wearing your seatbelt, um, you fall and break a rib and the rib pokes into there, any of those things, if you get outside air into the thorax, then your lung will probably collapse because all the air will rush in through the hole and push the lung shut. It's essential that we get carbon dioxide out of our body because too much carbon dioxide leads to an acidic bloodstream. And you don't want your bloodstream to become too acidic. So by exhaling carbon dioxide, 
then you're also maintaining the body's pH. So we have a very narrow range that our blood likes to be in. And you can either breathe in more oxygen and breathe out more carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide dissolved in your bloodstream is known as carbonic acid. So that would just give you a little hint there. Whenever you drink a Coke, you're drinking carbonic acid or Pepsi or Mountain Dew, whatever fizzy drink that you're drinking. That's the bubbles are carbon dioxide. So it's that acidic taste that we really like in our, in our fizzy drinks. You can change the rate of respiration. You can change the depth, how much you breathe in. But we normally just breathe in, breathe out in what we call a tidal respiration. But we have reserve volume. If we want to take deeper breaths, we can. If we want to exhale more, we can. So we have a, an inspiratory and an expiratory reserve that we'll be talking about in just a second. So you've got things like your autonomic nervous system that is telling you to breathe. You have receptors that tell you if you're stretching too much. You have chemical receptors so that you release chemicals that will affect your breathing. The hypothalamus is in charge of, of your uh, part of your breathing and part of the cerebral cortex. So there's a lot of things helping you breathe. And one of the things that I mentioned, uh, or hopefully I mentioned in the lecture, is there are um, sometimes babies just stop breathing. They're just, for no particular reason, you put them to bed, they're happy, healthy, and you wake up the next morning and they've passed away in their sleep. And they found a part of the brain that's damaged in those children that causes them to, to have sudden infant death or SIDS, where they just stop breathing. So uh, used to, they thought, well, maybe the parents, you know, smothered the child or, you know, they didn't know what was going on. But now we actually can check and uh, we know that there is a part of the brain that is often affected that causes SIDS. So if you've lost one child of SIDS, you can have the next child check to make sure that they don't have the same um, abnormality in the brain. So you have the autonomic nervous system causing you to breathe. So you don't have to say, okay, I got to breathe in now. Now I got to exhale. <sighs> okay, now I have. So it's not under your voluntary control. You, you don't have to do that kind of like the heart. You don't have to tell the heart to beat. It just does. But unlike the heart, it's kind of hard to speed the heart up with your mind and slow it down with your mind. But it's quite easy to change your um, breathing voluntarily. So if I know that I'm about to sing or scream or yell across an, uh, an auditorium or something, then I know that I'm going to have to take a bigger breath than I normally do. So I will take a really deep breath. So you see these uh, amazing singers who do that when they need to, to get a really deep breath to be able to hit a high note and hold it for a very long time. They will really take in a deep breath. And people who dive for pearls, have trained their lungs to where they can actually breathe in and stay underwater for like seven or eight minutes, which you and I would drown after like three minutes probably. So you can override it voluntarily and quite easily. But once you stop, like a little kid that says, I'm going to hold my breath until I die. And so they voluntarily stop breathing. But when they don't get enough oxygen, they'll pass out and they'll start breathing normally again. So you really can't hold your breath until you die, unless, of course, you put a plastic bag over your head, and then you could. All right, so with the spirometer, we're going to look for how much volume you can hold in your lungs, how fast you can blow the air out of your lungs. So you wouldn't really think about that. We just breathe it in, breathe it out. But some people have um, obstructions. 
they have trouble exhaling. They can't get it all, all the air out. So these are the people that wouldn't be able to blow out their own birthday candles because they can't blow the air out fast enough to get enough of a wind to blow out candles. So we're going to talk about restrictive and obstructive disorders. And we're going to look at tidal volume, residual volume. So one of your questions for your quiz is, what is the tidal volume? Normally, it's about half a liter. So if you guys can pull up in your mind a four liter, excuse me, a two liter Coke, two liter Pepsi, whatever, about a fourth of that is how much you breathe in and out, if that was air, breathing in and out, to try to give you a volume that you can see in your mind. All right, uh, residual volume. There is always some air in the lungs. You never exhale all the air in the lungs. If you did, your lungs would collapse. So you don't want to do that. So you always have at least a liter remaining in your lungs. Now, these, this is called a tilde, this little snaky-looking thing, and it means approximately. So if you've got a great big football player, He's going to have a totally different lung capacity than a little old lady like me. So I have a much smaller lung capacity than a man. I'm also really short, so that gives me even a smaller lung capacity. And then I'm old. So all those things will limit these. So I would be on the lower end of these. All righty. Your vital capacity is the absolute maximum amount of air you can breathe in and breathe out. And remember, you cannot get rid of that residual volume. So if you look at this graph, right here is the residual volume, and it's a little over a liter. So no matter how you breathe, unless you, your lung collapse, you cannot breathe this out. It will always be in there. There will always be air and it, that's good because it's constantly exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide. This kind of yellow area right here is your tidal volume. So I'm breathing in and breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. And so you get this tracing like this. And then if somebody says, okay, blow out as much air as you possibly can. So here's somebody blowing the air out as much as they possibly can. And from here to here is the expiratory reserve volume. So they painted it in here in blue for you, right there. So I don't normally breathe out, but just this much, that about half liter. But if you tell me to breathe out everything I possibly can, then this is what's going to happen. This is what it looks like. So now my lungs are only holding about 1,000 to 1,200 liters of air, where normally you're holding at least 2.5 liters. And then you go up to 3 liters, down to 2.5 liters, up to 3 liters, 2.5. So you can force the air out, and that's the expiratory reserve volume. So you don't normally use it, but it's there if you need it. And then they go back to tidal volume. You know, the waves come in on the tide, the waves go out, the waves come in, the waves go out. So that's why they call this the tidal volume, because it just comes in and out, in and out. And then somebody says, okay, take a deep breath, and you breathe in as much air as you possibly can. This is your inspiratory reserve volume. So you have the capability of expanding your lungs this far, but you don't normally do it. So it's your reserve. It's your backup if you need it. So here's where somebody went from the maximum that they could breathe in to the maximum they could exhale. And that's your vital capacity. Vital means life. This is your life capacity. All right, your total lung capacity would be if you added this part, you can't exhale, your functional reserve, or excuse me, your residual volume, 
and you add your expiratory reserve volume right there, your tidal volume, and um, your inspiratory reserve volume. So if you add all that together, you can end up with your total lung capacity right there, which is a little over five liters. So if we were in lab in person, we would be using computers and vernier uh, programs. But unfortunately, like I said, we're, we're, uh, you're going to have to do a simulation. And you look at how to calculate the tidal volume, how to calculate the inspiratory reserve volume, the expiratory reserve volume, vital capacity, residual volume, and total lung capacity. So you need to, to actually learn how to do that. What things do you add together on there to, f to figure this out? Or if you were given this graph, could you tell me what the expiratory reserve volume is? Could you come over here and say, well, you take um, 2,500 and you come down here to 1,200 and you just subtract those two numbers. And that's your expiratory reserve volume. So you need to be able to read this graph. If you go from 2,500 to 3,000, that's your vital or your tidal volume. It's your tidal volume, so it's a half a liter. So make sure you can do the math here. All righty. That's it. This lab's fairly simple, but you do need to know that graph inside and out.